we are given a sense of our own existence that is in flat contradiction to the facts of nature. Although, in its own way, there is something natural about that, because nothing can happen at all that is not in some way connected with an elaborate scheme, uh, not a scheme that, as it were, had a plan in mind, but nevertheless a scheme that is musical in its nature. And even our delusions are part of that. But nevertheless, they are sometimes extraordinarily odd, and we are given by our society, by our tradition and upbringing, by our culture, a very weird sensation of our own existence. And that is the sensation of strangeness, of being somebody who, as we say, comes into this world, Whereas when you are born, you should say that you came out of this world. You don't come into it. Where else is there to come from? In uh, the philosophy that we've inherited, however, and that underlies our common sense, there are some ideas which account for this sensation of strangeness. And I'm going to spend the first session examining the history of that. But what I want to say to make things clear from the outset, especially to those of you who are, who are strangers to these seminars, is that, strictly speaking, you, that, that which you feel most inwardly and intimately to be yourself, uh, is obviously part and parcel of the works, uh, we might say the plays, but what there is, we could say in a slangy way, the witch than which there is no witcher. The Hindus say tattvamasi, which is in Sanskrit saying that thou art. You're it. Only you're playing you aren't. And that's what it was always doing. But basically, never fear. What is absolutely central and fundamental to you is what the Christians might call God or the Godhead. And uh, you're pretending you aren't. And you're pretending very cleverly. So that the illusion is extraordinarily convincing. Or if we put it in terms that do not require these, what we today call mythological concepts of God or Brahman or whatever, we can simply say that every individual is what the total cosmos is doing at a place called here and now or a place called I. I is a pronoun of position like this, here, so on. And so that's the way things actually work. And anyone can see it and it can be proved to the satisfaction of anybody by purely physical evidence. Only we are trained to feel the exact opposite, you see, that we are little creatures sort of looking over our shoulders and wondering where the hell we are and what's going to happen next and that this isn't our arrangement at all and that uh, we're caught in a great cosmic trap. O thou who didst with pitfall and with gin beset the road I was to wander in. You know, that kind of idea. Now, what accounts for this? How could we possibly have come to feel this way? Well, there are a lot of reasons, but the two that I want to concentrate on this morning are two mythologies that have influenced everybody's thinking in the Western world. The first we'll call the Jewish Christian mythology, and the second, the Newtonian mythology, or mechanistic mythology. 
And the latter, of course, has a far more dominant influence on educated people today than the other ones. But let's look and see what they really involved in our feelings about the world and about our place in it. First of all, in the Jewish Christian mythology, we are here in a relationship to the ultimate reality, which is comparable to the relationship between a great king and his subjects. This king is modeled on the ideal type of a great Near Eastern king who might have lived, say, around four or 3,000 B.C. You remember, don't you, in reading about the fact that when those kings died, all their families and servants and many of their subjects were buried with them. They were killed outright by being, uh, well, buried alive in the, in the royal tomb. And Thomas Mann made the observation that in those days it seemed as if human heads had no backs to them. As if one were simply a mask and that what uh, was behind you was something altogether beyond you so that you were completely identified with your tribe, with your human family. And so uh, uh, the king was like a queen bee. The abs the, well, we would say the king pin upon which everything depends. And when that's blown out, everybody collapses with it. Only later did we grow backs to our skulls and then begin to feel enclosed. That was a very important step, but a troublesome one. We don't feel in the lines of G.K. Chesterton, but now a great thing in the street seems any human nod where move in strange democracy the million masks of God. We don't feel that, we see. We feel all by ourselves. But we can get it back, this sensation of being uh, absolutely one with the whole and at the same time retain everything that we have won by the development of Western-style personality, the ego. So then, this, this model of the world, based on the idea that we are all subjects of the divine king, was, you might say, a political model based on the organization of the great city-states of the ancient Near East. And that image, you see, has absolutely haunted Western man throughout his whole development. Because he has felt that he is in this universe on probation, on sufferance. He doesn't quite belong here because there's this great big giant spirit who is saying to him, yeah, now you watch out. You're just a miserable little worm and I evoked you here out of nothing. Of course I love you because I am I am love. I am a very good father and everything that I do, however much it hurts, is for your good. But you watch out and don't you dare look me in the eye. So everybody does this. See? All those customs where the ruler is faced this way with, with head down and so no looking at him directly is based on this mythology. And of course it's based too on some political facts because when a big man does attain to eminence Everybody is against him secretly. They hate him for it. So he has to be surrounded with guards and secret police. And people all lie with their faces on the floor so that they're in a position where they can't attack. 
That's the whole idea. And that's why in the royal court, the throne has its back to the wall. There is nothing behind the throne. There are just guards on either side who can be watched a little. You see? So in a church, when the altar or the episcopal throne is right with its back to the wall, this really indicates a situation of fear. But if I'm not afraid of you, uh, I shouldn't really have my back to the wall at all here in this situation. <laughs> uh, only rooms are designed, our whole architecture uh, following the design of original courthouses is made that way. After all, one should walk out into the middle of people and uh, have people behind you, if you can trust them. <laughs> so, uh, this model, I call it a model of the universe, based on the kingly court, uh, did certain very important things for us. It gave us the idea, for example, of universal law. Uh, it lies at the roots of many of our best ideas of justice. But it bugged us. It really bugged us because you felt that you were never, never free from the penetrating glance of an all-seeing eye that watched everything you do. I have a friend who is a humorous Catholic and in her toilet she has the old fashioned kind with a tank on the pipe going down to the seat and right on that pipe there is a little tile with an eye on it and written underneath in gothic letters it says thou God seest me <laughs> so everywhere there is no escape at the most intimate moments or in the most intimate thoughts you are under judgment you are being watched. Big Father is watching you. You see? Now that made the Western world more and more and more uncomfortable. They couldn't stand it. They felt that uh, this was the paradox involved. To believe in that kind of a God, a personal God, has this good thing about it that it's saying that the ultimate reality that which underlies everything that happens is intelligent and not only intelligent but uh, beneficent even if in a rather a stern and authoritarian way but at least it's alive the universe in other words has a heart But we switched to the opposite mythology because we couldn't stand it. And in the course of the 18th and 19th centuries evolved the idea that the universe doesn't have a heart at all. That it is essentially stupid. And that we sensitive, intelligent beings capable of love and all sorts of feelings are an accident. A really deplorable accident. But what a monstrous system in which the tender, sensitive nervous systems that we are could appear in a world that consists principally of rock and fire. That is an impersonal, vast, gyrating nonsense which has no consideration for us men whatsoever. Now, why did such an idea possess the Western world? Why could it be that in the 19th century Freud could talk about the basic energies of the psyche as libido and compare them to the blind forces of brute emotions, you know? Think of that language. At the same time, Ernst Haeckel and T.H. Huxley and uh, 
so on, were thinking about uh, the world as the manifestation of energy. Uh, say Henri Bergson with the idea of the élan vital. Uh, what was the nature of this energy which manifested everything? Essentially, it was something like electricity. Now, electricity it does wonderful things for us, but essentially, electricity is rather dumb. You switch it on and switch it off. Supposing I could just switch you on and switch you off, you see. But just like that, say, please don't bother me anymore. <laughs> and you'd vanish. <laughs> but that's the you see they thought of the world as having as being just a surge of <clears throat> like this you see but completely stupid only after they how on earth they ever got an intelligence out of this is a miracle but they did by explaining that if you gave it enough time it would eventually become intelligent well, that's the most nonsensical idea anybody ever thought of. That if just time, you see, would make things more complicated. Now, I want you to... This is the thing that is difficult today, because that idea of the mechanical universe, that is essentially dead, is a very persuasive one. And... Most intelligent people today who are products of the college and that particular system of propaganda and indoctrination really feel that this is the case. That they are strangers in an alien world. And that when you die it will just be like you were a caterpillar that was squashed, and that will be that. Uh, that you're, in other words, an, an interlude of consciousness between eternal darknesses, and that's all there is. It doesn't mean anything. It is just, just that, and not much of that anyway. Not much of a that. Now, what is important is to understand that this is a myth. There aren't, just as the other thing about the great cosmic king is also a myth. There is no foundation for it in fact whatsoever. But it's a way, you see, of putting the world down when it had been put up too much. The reaction. The world had been put up too much by being made embarrassingly intelligent. You see, here yeah, was that all-seeing eye who was saying to you, da, 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 every minute, you see. Better a dead world than one watching me like that. Now let's look at certain elements in the 19th century myth, the Newtonian myth, that are very interesting. First of all, Let's consider what it says about the nature of human consciousness, of the mind, of being aware. There really is no such thing as a mind. The, the, what we call mind and life is a kind of scum that grows after a long time on the top of rocks. You see, it looks upon the human being as a cell-infested skeleton just as it looks upon the earth as a life-infested rock. It sees no real connection between the rock, which is the earth, or the fiery metallic ball, and the life that's creeping on its surface. That's an excrescence. Now, excrescence means something that grows out of. But look how we use the word, an excrescence of something. It sounds almost like excrement. Uh, we, we use it in a deprecatory way. And you've got to watch very much how people use words and the tone of voice they put into them because that shows you what game they're playing. So when they say life is an excrescence, or they've got another word they have at those times, an epiphenomenon. 
a mere epiphenomenon. Note the word mere. That word does more damage in philosophy than any other one I know. It's merely energy, you know? You are... <laughs> all the matter with you is this, you're merely nervous. Oh, something like that. <laughs> so, uh, in this system of things, they, they explained that the whole world is merely mechanical, but that we are here is a sort of accident, and we are an excrescence, we are a fungus, we are a sort of growth like lichen on rocks. And uh, that's all we are. Now, uh, this was to say, on the one hand, that man is a product of nature, he's not the special creation of a supernatural god, but they didn't, as a result of feeling that man is a product of nature, become friendly with nature, as you would have supposed they might. They hated nature all the more, and all the more furiously, for bringing us forth. And therefore waged and initiated the war against nature that began with the 19th century. And has been pressed into the 20th, the idea, in other words, that the only hope there is for the human spirit is to beat the environment into submission. Because it's an alien environment. It's a hateful, mechanical, stupid bunch of nonsense. And if we don't get in there with our cleverness and power and smash it into submission, we have no future. We're just going to be wiped out one day when the sun gets too hot and blows up. And that'll be that. But before that happens, which will maybe a million years from now, we expect to inhabit other galaxies, to have the sun under control, you know, uh, all sorts of wires fixed into it and things, and so that it'll behave itself. And then we'll, we'll rule the roost. Now, having examined then these two uh, mythological forms, which underlie the Western man's intense feeling of alienation and separateness, we have to go into another dimension of the question. And that is the influence upon who we think we are of our social institutions. We know that there are things like uh, the family, marriage, the police, the courts, the law, the church, and we know that these are social institutions. But social institutions are far more subtle than those things. Time, for example, is a social institution. Because it is a matter of convention, that is to say, of coming together to agree to measure time in a certain way. And we have international agreement about that. Likewise, obviously, money is a social institution. So are weights and measures. So are uh, ideas of value. What is the good life? Who is contributing to society and who is working against it? So you see, we were discussing this morning, among the other things, uh, excuse me, the idea of survival. And uh, that, that survival is a good thing. And to survive as long as possible is a very good thing. But that is a form of social institution. It is something we have come to agree about. It isn't necessarily true in the sense that, shall I say, the French language is not a truer language than the English. But so long as people agree to speak a certain language, they can communicate. And they've decided that communication is a good thing. 
So any language that makes communication possible is a good language. And the, in a way, the more people who agree about it, the better. But it is a matter of agreement. You see, same way, the lines of latitude and longitude are conventions. They are, but they don't exist. You can't tie up packages with the equator. But it's a very useful idea. And so in the same way, the ways in which we have shaped the constellations, that we all agree that the stars called the Big Dipper look something like a dipper. And uh, though, you know, there aren't any strings tying them together, the constellation is not there as a constellation. So in a sense, we project our institutions onto the world in rather the same way that psychiatric patients project images onto a Rorschach blot. And what interests the psychiatrist is what sort of images this person produces that tells him something about the person. In the same way, our social institutions tell us something about people. When we see some very exquisite pattern we look at it and say, my, isn't that wonderful? Isn't that intelligent looking? I wonder who did it. Because we associate all intelligence with a who. And when you look at a plant, it's obviously intelligent. It's, it's shape. It's rhythm. It's all its wonderful tubes inside its complex relationship to bees and birds and to the surrounding atmosphere and light. This is a very intelligent affair. Now, in, in just the same way, we are related to the external world as plants are in amazingly complicated ways. And by and large, we don't notice them. Because the, ca the, the aspect of our consciousness with which we notice things is very limited. It notices what it calls facts, things and events, and uh, pinpoints them, it, it pulls them out as significant. You see, when you remember coming here and what you saw and who was here, you only remember very tiny bits of the whole scene. You will not remember what very many people wore unless you happen to be interested in clothes. You won't really remember how they did their hair, what their styles were, unless you are peculiarly interested in hairstyles. You probably won't notice their shoes at all. And goodness knows what else that nobody has ever thought to notice. But when under certain circumstances our consciousness becomes expanded as in mystical vision, you begin to become aware of things that you don't notice. One of the most important things that we don't notice is space. Most people regard space as nothing. It's just a void, a uh, in which we move around. But actually, space is terribly important. It has properties. We are all something happening in space in rather the same way that a whirlpool occurs in water. Space has uh, turns in it. It has ripples in it. It has places where it's denser than at other places. And this is all becoming clear in physics but it's certainly not impinged upon the consciousness of the average intelligent person. There is no manifestation of energy without space. Also, we can drag in time, but I don't want to make it complicated. I want to make this little image as simple as possible so as to understand the importance of space. That is to say, of the surroundings of things, of the background. And the background 
is ignored in ordinary consciousness. But in mystical consciousness, the background becomes important. You become aware vividly of the fact that you, as a, an individual, imply by your existence everything else that exists. or ever has existed, or ever will exist. You can't exist as the kind of person you are without all that. Now that's the secret to the connection between you and the cosmos. Just as a back doesn't exist without a front. In just that sort of way, all of it doesn't exist without you, and you don't exist without all of it. Even if you die, you see, and disappear totally. Nevertheless, the fact that you have existed is still a fact. And a universe in which there has been a person like Socrates is quite a different universe from a universe in which there hadn't been a person like Socrates. Socrates, having existed, is a symptom of the way things are. So fundamentally, we get a picture of the cosmos in which the self, the real I, is the whole thing. Just as we say of an individual human body, you are John Doe, and that's all of you. Although if we look at you very carefully under an electron microscope, we will find that molecules in your blood are further apart than the Earth and the Sun. What makes you think you're a unity? It's quite a thought. Well, it's space. <laughs> and so in the same way as such a relationship exists between our, our galaxy and other galaxies and so on. It's obvious. So, uh, then, by various conventions and social institutions, we develop the impression that this isn't so. We learn to ignore. We learn not to notice certain things. And do you, do you know not noticing is very, very important? In the Hindu theory of politics, uh, all the, what are spiritual virtues have political counterparts. For example, in uh, the spiritual domain, the word upaya, U-P-A-Y-A, -A, means merciful techniques for awakening people. Clever devices used by a teacher. In the, in the political domain, the word upaya means cunning, deceit. Likewise, in the spiritual domain, upeksha means equanimity. In the political domain, upeksha means overlooking. When, for example, the boss of the big concern finds that an, one of his employees is taking out a little bit of the petty cash. Now he figures out, is this man worth it? Are his services uh, really worth it? And shall I merely ignore the fact that he's doing this? That would be upeksha. Now in our whole society, we do an enormous amount of upeksha. The things we overlook, 